that's uh, going through chemo treatments, and she is spending the day in support of this dear friend. So uh, uh, just if you have an extra thought or two, uh, shout out to Carrie for doing a great caregiving work. Um, how many of you have been bowling before? Bowling, right? Have you ever been in a bowling club? Check out the gear. <laughs> I am going to the game tonight, but I've never been part of a bowling club, even though my shirt says that. Um, but how many times have you seen a bowling club where you go bowling? They're having a ball, right? Everybody's getting involved. It, it almost doesn't matter what the story is, or, you know, how they're doing. Uh, but the reason I wanted to bring up that reference is we're getting ready to kick off National Digital Inclusion Week. Uh, and for as long as we've been having these meetings, while we use them and take advantage of those great networking opportunities, what we have a chance to do, and one of the things you'll hear about in today's meeting, is an opportunity for us to all participate, just like you would if you were part of a bowling club. Um, without having to go to a bowling range to do it. Um, and that's going to be to showcase how acting as a coalition we can truly get after those four big objectives. So broad participation, raise awareness, overcome obstacles, and connect people, which is ultimately why we operate as a coalition. So uh, that's just the preview. What we've got today is uh, our monthly meeting, and I want to make sure that I uh, get a few announcements. Uh, we start out just by going through what our mission and vision is. Uh, and I think most of you uh, here have been here before, so you should be pretty familiar with that. Um, if you haven't, sign in, or if you're here for the first time, please make sure that you get your name and information uh, set up on the sign-in sheet, and make sure you don't forget your parking validation ticket. There's a device back on the table um, that gets you free parking, um, and you've got the Wi-Fi networking password in there as well. Um, we do operate a uh, Twitter handle, which is Include KC, and a Facebook page, as well as our website, digitalinclusionkc.org. This is a listing of uh, the steering committee leadership, uh, and we meet to uh, plan the agendas and to uh, keep us organized on uh, making sure that the, the work we do achieves those four main objectives. And I've got to tell you, just over the past month, I was at two national conferences. One was the N10, which is a national technology, sorry, nonprofit technology network. Uh, they had their annual conference in New Orleans. Uh, digital inclusion was part of the focus area, and Kansas City's coalition got a lot of attention there. Uh, and then the following week was the National Digital Inclusion Alliance Net Inclusion Summit in Cleveland. Uh, and we had quite a, a good rep representation there. Other cities really need to look at what we're doing uh, as a coalition and um, to try to emulate the idea that we, at a minimum, we bring people together once a month and we share ideas and we try to get the word out about what digital inclusion is all about. This is our leadership group, so make sure you reach out to any of us if you have any ideas and suggestions for us going forward. So today's meeting, um, we're going to go through a few announcements, but then we really only have two main topics to focus on. Uh, one is going to come to you from Wendy Thurston, uh, who works here at the library, uh, and is going to tell you about uh, activity, a set of activities we've got planned for Digital Inclusion Week. And then we have a spotlight speaker, uh, Sarah Martin, who is going to share with you some, uh, some really critical information that highlights the growing importance of digital inclusion with respect to healthcare. Uh, and health outcomes. Um, so uh, again, I just want to uh, bring um, the whole lot on that. So before we go to the uh, I do want to take this time now for everyone to please just stand up and state your name and uh, the organization you're with. Uh, if you have a five or ten second little promo of anything you want to know, don't shy away from it. Just know that thanks to Rick Usher, the assistant city manager, we are on Facebook Live. So, uh, <laughs> FEC, Tom Rance, you guys want to start out? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, my name is Daniel Smith. I'm the Chief Officer. 
with the Full Employment Council. Uh, right now, we're really uh, pushing our wheel with youth, and our, we're about to ramp up for the summer uh, job program, summer youth job program. So uh, really just trying to target youth between the age of 16 and 24. Uh, so if you have any of those youth that you work with or any other organizations that you guys work with, um, this is the line he'll introduce us in a minute. He's the youth development director at uh, the Full Employment Council, so direct them to us and uh, or just make contact so we can uh, get, get some folks some jobs and get some money in their pocket. So appreciate it. Uh, my name is Delon Hart Graves. I'm the Youth Development Director at the Full Employment Council. Uh, one of the things that we're doing, uh, being we're trying to ramp off, is we're trying to we develop a youth development board um, and council with a lot of different uh, youth mentors, adult mentors, and community partners within the community. Um, we're just asking if anybody's interested in volunteering with youth or would not have any uh, aspirations to work with youth. If you want to, please volunteer. Uh, it's only take about maybe an hour of commitment uh, a month. We do like an activity each month for the youth and the community. Uh, and, and during these youth councils, what we do is we find out what the youth want to do. So that's why we have youth council members on this uh, particular committee to find out what they're interested in, what are the new and, uh, new and latest uh, creative things that's going on out there. So we try to implement that into the activities that we do for the youth each month. Um, we also have a couple of new grants. We have a women's empowerment grant called One Two that we're trying to push towards. Uh, it's an apprenticeship program to help uh, get women in uh, occupations that they're uh, traditionally underrepresented in. Um, so this uh, apprenticeship program basically gives them on-the-job training uh, into professions such as IT, finance, um, and, and welding, manufacturing, things of that nature. And so it allows the, we, we will pay the employer to bring these uh, individuals on as uh, interns or apprentices and teach them the craft before they go out to the workforce uh, development field. So um, if anybody has any questions or anything like that, feel free to reach out and I'll give you my contact back with you. Thank you. This is great. Daniel and Blum, I just want to cut in. This week there was also the uh, Alliance for Economic Inclusion event at the Kaufman Foundation. Uh, and, and the theme was workforce development and jobs. Clyde uh, Queen from FSC was on the panel. Uh, and at those two national conferences that I referred to just a while ago, jobs, jobs, skills, workforce development, that's more and more uh, the centerpiece of what digital inclusion efforts are, are being talked about. I know Nicholas is involved in, in job placement. I saw Lauren just walk in from Goodwill. You're going to hear from more and more of our efforts focusing on um, job skills and jobs. So um, glad you guys are here. You've been consistent, regular attendees. So thanks for everything you Good morning, everyone. Morning. Well, my, name, my name is Nicholas Wiggins. I work for an agency called Jobs for America's Graduates, where we focus on building, um, hopefully now, a right, 21st century project-based learning curriculum. Um, and so a lot of my energy and efforts for that focus on uh, digital literacy. Good morning, I'm Bill Mullins, uh, founding member of the Kessler Institute, Kansas City, and I'm the only official member. Um, but I want to quickly mention, take up uh, Tom's bowling story, because it brought to mind my very first experience with big data. Uh, when I was in the seventh grade, my dad was the secretary of a bowling league. There were about 200 people in that league. And I got delegated the responsibility every week of recalculating all the averages. And he got that job because he had an electronic mechanical calculator. You know, I have my nine decimal places and all that. But, so I, I, I was just put in mind of like every, so they bowled on Thursday night, and I had like you know, until the first of the week to update couple hundred averages. And so, uh, of course, errors, if you think they don't take their game seriously, trust me, if I made a mistake in calculating those averages, uh, I would hear about it. So, this idea has been around for a long time. I'm Todd Sullivan with Kansas City Public Schools, and kudos to Full Employment Council. I've spent the last couple of months helping with a project that's going from Full Employment Council through the school district. It's called Middle College Program that's helping kids get their GED or their equivalent uh, at the community college, and uh, it's all thanks to work that they're doing, and the, the district is just a conduit of students who need to do that. So, uh, again, the full public council doing great work, even through the school district. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Hall. I'm the 
is Daisy Griffin. I'm the AmeriCorps VISTA and Project Manager with KC Digital Drive. We work to bridge the digital divide and promote KC's reputation as a smart city by helping drive pilot projects in civic and social innovation. And we also host a couple of annual conferences here that are national. I'm Susan Norris from Echoes Collective. Hi, I'm Chris Hernandez, City Communications Director, part of the large contingent from the city of Kansas City, Missouri, putting your tax dollars to work to help bridge the digital divide. Uh, we have a lot of things happening. Uh, one of the things we're going to do soon, based on a suggestion from Carrie here at the library, was to take the resources uh, that you guys are promoting as a coalition uh, and promote that to our own employees. We have a pretty big employee base that uh, needs actually some help getting across that digital divide uh, within our own organization. So we're going to do that internally. So you might not see that in a public way, but that's something we're going to work on throughout the year. We also have uh, new uh, initiatives coming up later this year, including uh, a major upgrade to our city's website. So I will, at some point, once we get our vendor in place, come back to this group to say, hey, take a look at some of the things we're looking at, give us your feedback, make sure you put, tell us what you want to see with the new website, so you'll be included in our stakeholder group that we reach out to as we're designing that. And um, we are, you may have heard of, that Rick has probably talked before about the um, Compass KC, which is an online permitting system to try to make things uh, easier for people to do business with the city. That is still in the works, but coming out a little later this summer. So, a lot of stuff out there. I'm Lauren Salida on the Goodwill. I'll let my colleague Chris here give a, give a plug for the newest project we have going on with Connecting for Good and Evil. So I'm Chris Allen, uh, the Program Manager for uh, Goodwill's Quest Academy, which is a training partner uh, with Connecting for Good and, and, and uh, Google uh, to make sure that we are offering training classes for folks to help them be more employable. Uh, basic computer digital literacy and even some advanced um, office uh, skills, things like that, but then even moving into some higher IT level certifications uh, to make sure that we are finding folks to fit into those jobs that the market has hundreds or thousands of right now, but there's very few qualified candidates to fill those jobs. So we're hoping to bridge that gap and uh, love doing it. Thanks, Chris. Quick, uh, just a day. You may have seen some Twitter activity in the last couple of days. We recently heard from Home Depot, their Midwest Plains staffing center, um, and they have been researching <laughs> digital inclusion groups in Kansas City because that it's a target area for them to find people to fill jobs that don't require uh, uh, high school and college degrees. And um, so they're looking to partner with us in the work that we're doing with Quest Academy. Uh, I'm filming some of the job openings they have here in the area, so we'll be working closer together on that here in the coming weeks. Good morning, I'm Bob Henderson with Verizon, and I uh, just wanted to give a quick update. Last uh, month we talked about uh, nominating uh, middle schools for Verizon Innovative Learning Center, um, and there's over 5,000 nominations that uh, the company's actually looking through right now, and we we'll announced this one. I'm Rachel Merlow with Google Fiber. I'm a lousy bowler. Hi to Bob Akers on the live stream. Uh, if you're a subscriber to the Google Fiber blog, you will see next week in your inbox our 2017 Community Impact Report. So you'll see some numbers on our work in Kansas City. And thanks to everyone who helped make that possible in advance. And uh, if you're not a subscriber, you go online and get it in your inbox. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Coco Lawson, also with Google Fiber, and uh, I think Richard kind of covered um, most of it, and uh, as you all know, we partner with a lot of nonprofits organizations here in the city, and also work with a lot of STEM programming um, and delivering different coding activities to uh, kids that are not uh, always uh, as close to uh, these types of programs. Matt Ziegenhorn with Mind Drive uh, after school program here in KC. Um, you've heard me talk about Future Fest for less than a month out. Um, I want to thank our, our people here in, the, uh, in our inclusion network that have helped us get this event going. We're sponsorship with Google, and thank you for helping out with uh, infrastructure and Wi Fi for the day. 
Um, again, I'm going to push it because it's the day after our next inclusion on the 2nd of June. Um, but it is, it's a free event with drone technology, electric vehicle test drives, and then STEM education, kind of a clearinghouse for families to get connected with programs similar to ours that are doing cool stuff with our kids in the community. So um, I want to thank the city of Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, we are actually approved for funding through the Neighborhood Tourism Development Fund, which is uh, really awesome for first year. Things. We're really excited to have that backing and, and be able to kind of scale this up to make it a really successful piece for the city. So thanks. I'm John Day with New Tech Game Software. And I stopped bowling after I hurt my back. I always like to go to those events anyway. So. <laughs> anyway, I also represent HTWebPro.com. Uh, it's a group that we meet uh, helping web developers learn more about becoming web developers. And we're helping millennials, mature workers, and we're looking to also help uh, military get employment opportunities within their particular workforce. Uh, we're scheduling for startups on workshops, boot camps, and all you need to You're invited to come anytime you want, and we need a centric training uh, every, let's see, third Monday of the month. Hello, everyone. My name is Melissa Wade. Um, I'm also with Connecting for Good. I'm the development coordinator, and I'm also at Ameriport Vista. Um, I know that Lindsay will give you a good recap or a good intro of everything that's going on um, in National Digital Inclusion Week next week. Um, at our Linwood location, we are actually hosting a smartphone workshop. Mobile will be there. They'll be bringing out a mobile store. Um, People in the community can bring their phones in, get questions answered. We'll have um, a lecture on the different kind of apps you can download, the importance of safe usage, things like that. We also, I mean, that's on Tuesday. Um, on Thursday, we have a resume rally planned, so um, that's exciting. And then the end of the month, we at our KCK location, we have a STEM fair and open house coming up. So we're excited about everything that's going on. <laughs> I have been here being with the and do the thing. Could they can do this one? Probably that's what I feel about. I have a friend also who's been here on the day for the association. And we're a resource center for our community. And she's already given a big thanks to Tom and Connecting for Good and I can tell you that. Uh, digital inclusion and uh, Google Fiber. So, truly helping us out, and they're finishing up on our upgrade today as we speak. Uh, so, it will be a uh, uh, state of the art for the neighborhood right now uh, to come in and do uh, you know, on the internet of kids doing the homework and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, a big thanks. I you destiny. Uh, you just you're just poster children, if you will, for uh, the way the coalition works between the uh, Google Fiber community connections, uh, uh, outreach to us and others to provide help. Uh, you know where neighborhood associations are really the backbone of so many communities around the country. So we're going to go out of our way as part of our efforts during Digital Inclusion Week to really uh, showcase your story. And we're gonna be down here to take some more pictures and we want groups all around the country to see the benefits that we can have when we, when we work together and showcase how important it is to take advantage of networks like this. And the benefits that are gonna come to all of the, the residents of uh, your community that are gonna take advantage of all the services that you're offering. So thanks for coming here. So you're so dedicated to the uh, coalition. We appreciate you sharing your story. Hi, I'm Chuck Dion. I'm a tech supervisor for a third-party branding call desk company here in Kansas City, as well as I'm the lead tech uh, coach volunteer for the Kansas City Public Library Tech Coach Department. We do direct support for patrons and uh, underserved uh, residents um, for all technology needs. And that's Wendy. I work here at the library and help develop programs and services to help adults in our service area um, with really just basic digital literacy training and work workforce development skills and things like that. And I'll be talking to you more in a minute. So. 
Good morning, I'm Jeffrey Wilkins from Berkeley Lake Prairie, Kansas City, and I facilitate the Google workshop. Good morning, I'm Debbie Speedo. I'm also an AmeriCorps VISTA here at the Kansas City Public Library. I work as a tech access volunteer coordinator, so I manage the Google volunteer assessment track. I work under a workshop. Hi, I'm Daisy Oberman. I'm also a neuroforzista here at the library, and I'm the digital literacy curriculum developer here, so I'm working in the tech access program as well, um, supporting classes that we're developing. Hi, I'm Trevor Ryan from the Public Library in Lawrence, Kansas. My family is relocated in Kansas City, and I'm prepared to join this group because I work with Lawrence Public Library's uh, technology curriculum development as a volunteer for the last few months. And it seems like a really good opportunity. And a friend of mine, Sarah Bell, brought me here when I left to go. I'm going to make this uh, add. Sarah Bell, former Digital Inclusion Fellow, uh, for those of you who don't recognize the name. Well, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah. Right. That's me. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm with the uh, City of Kansas City Public Department, where I'm Deputy Director. Um, government, community relations, communications, marketing, policy, performance. Um, that's like all my domain. So, excited to tell you about what we're up to. Oh my God. Uh, good morning. I'm Lori. My company is Urban Tech. Uh, TEC stands for Technology and Power Communities. I work to help both the digital literacy divide and urban schools and communities. And so, I'm and I'm also a member of our Siri committee, the coalition. And Alan, he snuck in. I want to sure you guys get into that Hi, uh, Alan Adams, the Unified Government in City of Kansas and Wyandotte County, the Chief Knowledge Officer, and manager of our IT and geospatial uh, analysis and innovation team as well. So, glad to be here this morning. Okay, well, we're going to move right on to our program. I'd like to introduce Lenny Pearson, who's going to share with you some bowling club activities for this week. And I'm actually going to steal the spotlight on behalf of the library because I forgot to mention and can't believe it, but um, we actually were just awarded a grant so that we can become the eighth library nationwide to adopt digitalwork.org, uh, which is an amazing resource developed by the Public Library Association. If you're not familiar, digitalwork.org and a uh, really cool foundation for digital literacy curriculum that we're excited to launch probably later this summer officially. Um, so, on to Digital Inclusion Week. Honestly, when it comes to putting together special events, I'm usually not very excited about it, but this is one that I'm actually very excited to be a part of because we put together a great opportunity for the coalition to come together and do something collaboratively that is hopefully not going to impose on each of our you know, really busy schedules anyway. So, Okay, so if you haven't already, check out Digital Inclusion Week on NDIA's website. If your organization is doing anything special, um, just go ahead and, and get your event registered. It's super easy. It's a very simple form you fill out with your organization's name, website, and brief description of the project. <laughs> and then you can actually go in, and last time I was there was maybe Wednesday, and there were only three of us who had registered some projects. So even if you're not doing a really big, you know, event and you're just doing regular programs and you'd like to get it on the radar, just take a few minutes and, and get yourself locked in and uh, get that on the uh, official website there. Otherwise, you may have noticed on your tables some little half-page flyers. Um, the project that we put together for the coalition is actually just to set up a hotline, which the library has already done. We have a phone number designated, 
and a schedule. Oops. And I have put together a couple of uh, documents, and they are actually already in the share file for the Digital Inclusion uh, Coalition here. But if for some reason, actually, before you leave today, you will actually get the link to these and be able to access them and take a look. And um, I'd like everyone to first take a look at the uh, resource directory. This is something I just kind of started to get my mind straight about all of the resources that are available. So if people are in the community looking for you know, how to get an affordable computer, or they're interested in having the internet in their home but can't pay the prices, what are their options? Um, they are interested in getting a job but aren't confident in their computer skills, and so where can they go for training? And then maybe they have a laptop or a desktop at home but it's not working, and they can't afford to take it somewhere to get it fixed. What are their options there? So the idea with the hotline is to just give people a number to call, and then for two hours each day next week, they'll be able to reach a live person who will then help direct them to the resources that are available in our community. And so this spreadsheet here is to just help our volunteers, the people taking the calls, which will be you, um, you know, kind of navigate through the conversations with people and figure out what is out there. So I urge you that if you don't see your name or your organization on this spreadsheet, to go ahead, add a line, and get yourselves in there if you'd like to receive some referrals from these calls. And I've just kind of broken it down to, you know, the main categories for which people may be looking for resources. We've got some tech support, computer repair options, for example. Uh, some of these are ongoing, things that we do every day, all the time, and then some of them are actually special events. And then you've got uh, website links that take you directly to how you can find out more information. And then in the case of the library, we offer one-on-one appointments with a tech coach. And so there's a link here that if somebody's interested, you have them on the phone, just click that link fill in their information, and they'll get a call back so that we can get them scheduled. Now, in this uh, workbook here, the first tab is the schedule. Very straightforward, simple. If you're interested in taking the call, just enter your name, the organization, and email if these people will reach you, and the phone number. The phone number is obviously extremely important because we will forward this hotline to the phone number that you list there. Now, um, if the calls come in and you know you're already on the line, voicemail is already set up so that we can capture those calls and call people right back. Um, and it says on here, you know, we'll give you a call back within two business days, but people can be comforted in knowing that they're going to get a call probably almost immediately. Because um, we actually have library volunteers to fill in those uh, return calls as well. And then the third tab in the spreadsheet is just a very simple call log. This is really not for us to you know, track anybody specifically, except we want to know that we're getting people connected to their resources. If we need to follow up, um, and then um, you know, at the end of the week, we'll be able to tell, you know, how many people we've been able to help and get connected. And I think that is it. Like I said, I will share the link to these uh, documents. You have some flyers. Take as many as you'd like. The flyer PDF is actually in the folder that I will be sharing in case you can print some more out. And then, um, otherwise, just Maybe play around wherever you can pick up so we can get the word out and, and get people connected to the help that's available to them. So, just to clarify, you're mm -hmm. sharing this with the uh, um, email distribution yes. of coalition. If you are on this and receive, for example, the agenda announcement, the evil reminder for today, you're going to get this. And if you are not on that list, do not get those things. 
just make sure you add yourself to the new attendee list back there, and I'll get you by the end of the day. And feel free, of course, to share it with people who may not be in the coalition and, and could contribute or who would be interested. So, uh, thanks, Wendy. Before I introduce you, Sarah, I just wanted to add a couple of things. Uh, so, Connecting for Good is we're going to be working with the library. We're helping to fill out uh, the spreadsheet of all of those resources um, so that by the time this kicks off on Monday, we're going to have as comprehensive a list as we can of, of where and how to access resources. We're also committing myself. I'm going to take a two hour slot along with, we have three AmeriCorps businesses that are going to help. I know Stacy, you got volunteered by your boss, Aaron. Um, so we've already got five people um, in the mix. Uh, there's two other things I want to share with, with everyone in this room. Uh, any of you who choose to participate and, and fill out their information on this uh, Google Doc. Uh, I know Connecting for Good is going to be uh, sharing next week uh, through all of our social media. We've got about 9,000 followers. It's not huge, but it's not tiny either. Um, profiles um, of any and every coalition partner that we work with who helps us just share the word about National Digital Inclusion Week. We're going to be sharing those also with the NBIA, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, and the NTIA, which is part of the uh, Department of Commerce, that's the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Um, so we're going to do everything we can to publicize the efforts of coalition members. Uh, and, and the last thing I'll tell you is we've got an editorial um, that I'm writing, uh, it's been drafted, we're going to get it published in the Kansas City Star next week, either on Wednesday or Thursday. Um, if you sign up and uh, add your information to this Google Doc between now and first thing Monday morning, I'm going to be including reference to you, your organization, in that editorial that's going to be published about the work that we do as part of the Kansas City Coalition for Digital Inclusion. Yep, Bill. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Wendy, one question. Uh, Highline, how will it handle uh, if there's an excess of calls in addition to uh, how many responders do we have? I'm excited to uh, have a good call. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, because then that will indicate a need for us to maybe make this not such a special project, but a more permanent project. Uh, but really, if um, the voicemail, this line is set up for the and so even if people call outside of these hours or beyond digital inclusion week, uh, we were always going to be checking those voicemails and if these people called back and followed up with. And so um, right now, if we get you know so many people calling in at once, they can't get a live person, they're just gonna have to leave a message and then we're gonna call back through our pool of volunteers and they're taking care of. So I, I'll add one thing to that. I totally forgot to mention this. I had a discussion with one of our biggest and best partners. We are going to be taking advantage of this format. And that last slide that Wendy showed, we're going to do everything we can with our staff to capture every single call, um, who, who they are, what they're asking about. And this week is really just going to give us a baseline. Um, when we see what kind of reaction we can get, we're going to work with, with some partners who have offered to help us really promote this and advertise this um, so that it can really be a showcase of what we do as a coalition. So uh, I, I don't think we should have any shame in um, positioning this as an experiment, but we're doing the experiment through during National Digital Inclusion Week, and we're going to see what we can get. We would love to have an overabundance of calls. We are going to be spending some time over the weekend and throughout the first couple of days, Monday and Tuesday of next week, of taking these flyers literally to laundromats and churches and community centers and wherever we can find 
Uh, I know certainly through my wife's work in Operation Breakthrough and at Reconciliation Services and along Truth and Prospect in uh, the Northeast Independence Avenue, we've got Central Bank of Kansas City who's offering to hand these out for us. Um, so we want to get the word out and hopefully we'll get a lot of calls. Um, we'll work with the, putting a bunch of them down at FBC as well and hopefully we can get some down at Goodwill and Chris and Lauren. Um, so, um, what I like the best about it is we're focusing on the end users here and, and really trying to showcase that the, the end outcome we're driving from the coalition is those, those four goals, broadening participation, raising awareness, overcoming obstacles, connecting people. All right, so, uh, yeah, for questions. Uh, where, are you going to share the link with us or how, how do we use it? So, if you, if you receive this invitation today, then you're on the distribution list for the coalition. And Wendy is sending out shortly to that email distribution list the link to this Google okay. doc. Yeah. Okay. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Sarah Martin. Good morning. Good morning. Who is that? share right now, I'll share a wall, an office wall, going on leadership exchange in City Hall. We share a deep love of Broadway musical soundtracks. So it's a little loud. Um, over the 25th floor. My name is Sarah. It's so good to be here. It's so good to see so many friendly faces um, and to be able to connect with you and your organizations. I would ask you here to talk briefly about our community health improvement plan, which is actually not a health department plan. It's actually, I'm going to mess up Brick's Facebook Live. I'm going to move around a little bit. Okay, we got this much space? Good. No, you're, you're good um, to this side of the screen. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I like to walk and talk, so <laughs> we're uh, Our community health improvement plan, which it's funny because it's got this part in it that says digital equity. But then the more that we started working with other groups in the community, we said actually like, digital inclusion is everywhere in this plan. So Carrie, uh, I thought it would be a good idea if I could come here and share the plan with you. And that way you can see where you and your organizations can fit into it, um, either from a digital inclusion perspective or just from the rest of the good work that you do. Uh, and I think what you're going to see is that Kansas City is very innovative in the way that we define health. So I know that comes at healthcare. I'm going to talk very little about healthcare today. I'm going to talk a lot about health equity. And I'm going to talk a lot about the social and economic factors that produce health outcomes. Um, and those are, the, those are the dicey things to talk about, right? Because when we talk about those things, we're talking about the isms, you know, we're talking about racism and classism and sexism, and we're talking about historical legacies of racism and trauma in Kansas City and how we undo it, right? So uh, we can't undo anything that we can't communicate with each other, and that's why the work that you're doing is so great. I hope this clicker works. Great. So I'm going to start. If you remember nothing else from this entire presentation, you remember this slide, because this is the guiding principle of everything we do at the health department. This is what we believe. That health is not just a function of not having something, right? So it's not just, I don't have money, or I don't have education, or I don't have political power or agency. It's that I don't have it, and someone else has it. And someone else has a lot of it, right? And so that creates this imbalance, which produces worse outcomes than if everybody didn't have something. So inequity and inequality is really our guiding principle here. Um, inequality is not our guiding principle. Fixing inequality is our guiding principle. That made it sound very sad. Um, this is also what we uh, chose to measure at the city as like our measure of success. So for a long time, we used to ask questions on the citizen survey, resident survey. You know, it was like. How satisfied are you with the health department protecting you from tornadoes or whatever? And nobody answered those questions. 
So you have all done enough community engagement and surveys and things to know that people love skipping questions. Like they love saying, I don't know, or being neutral. And so we had the highest skip rate of any department in the city. Because people just didn't know what we did, right? So we said, okay, let's take a step back. Let's start measuring what matters. So now we measure things like social connections and isolation, economic mobility, right? So health status. We want to know that what we're doing in the city is actually manifesting in real outcomes. And life expectancy is our city's primary objective. I'm going to speak for the city first here. So I can do that. So, um, is it okay? I'm going to say life expectancy is the most important thing of all time ever. So, the how long we live is definitely something we need to keep an eye on, right? It was those differences by race that we saw in 2000, the year 2000. The health department director ordered a study, and that study showed a new seven-year difference in life expectancy between black and white men. And from that report was born the Mayor's Health Commission. The Mayor's Health Commission is tasked with creating the Community Health Improvement Plan. And you can think of that as kind of like a strategic plan for the city for health. And again, going back to it all matters what types of questions you ask. We used to ask things like, what diseases do you have, right? And then we would design a plan around those diseases. So this last go around, 2015, 2016, the health commission partnered with a university professor, that was me at the time, my past life, and we designed some new questions. And so instead of doing these paper surveys that we like doing, we just went to where people were congregating. We went to PTA meetings, we went to church meetings, we, went, we had like this army of interns and we are part of us. I love you guys. You guys, they were out of the meetings, sitting there and listening, and we had three questions. What would you get about your neighborhood to another neighborhood if you could get anything? Then we asked what you hope for the children in your neighborhood to have when they are older. And then we asked what keeps you of it? Like, what are you worried about when you wake up in the middle of the night? And we just listened. And from listening, we thought a chip that is super revolutionary. And it's like, maybe this is Friday, and I want to use like really big old terms, but we are literally consulting with other health departments all over the country as they look at our chip and they're like, how do you know with that? It's not a chip that says people need to stop smoking, people need to eat better, people need to not have diabetes. Like, this is something to say, we as a city will eat. These are the five things that impact health. And if we can fix these things, we will fix our life expectancy differences. Because, does anyone know the number one figure of your life expectancy in Kansas City? Oh, I already like, have indoctrinated so many people. Uh, yes, right. Who, who you can borrow a cup of sugar from. Who you can borrow a cup of sugar from. That's Rick's favorite social capital question. Um, <laughs> social connections, yes, isolation is a health risk. Um, in Kansas City, it's your zip code, right? So your zip code determines your life expectancy. And the crazy thing is that um, health burden has really nothing to do with that. And so we looked at the zip code life expectancy differences, and we saw there is up to a 14 year difference, only within a few miles in life expectancy by zip code. So what determines life expectancy in a zip code? What determines life expectancy changes by zip code? <coughs> Crime. Crime. Poverty. So those can affect your life expectancy any zip code, right? But what we see is that those zip codes, the lowest life expectancy, they change over time. And they're not changing because of the things the health department is doing. They're changing when people are moving. Sick people are moving out, healthy people are moving in. In 64106, somewhere, yeah. mm -hmm. that's my zip code too. 64106 saw a 15-year life expectancy increase in 20 years. We didn't do that in my health education. That was because sick people moved to 64129, which is now the lowest life expectancy that the 
in the entire city, and it's also decreasing over time. Let me show you that in a minute. I know you're trying to think from that in your head because I see people looking like we're six or one two nine. I'm going to show you. But look at this. Since 1999, that differed in the highest and lowest life expectancy of the code population. So something we're doing isn't working. And I believe that what we're doing by operating in these silos and saying health department, life expectancy is your job, was doing us a, a disservice. Because when I think about life expectancy, I think about jobs, and I think about economic development, and housing, environmental quality, and crime, and man, everyone needs to be on board, including everybody in this room. Um, this, is, this is your map. This is your latest map. So what you see here is the six lowest life expectancy zip codes right in the heart of the city. And those older nexus are decreasing life expectancy zip codes. And in this modern day, life expectancy should not be decreasing for anybody ever, right? Yes. So I just like to point out for the group mm -hmm. that if you change the title of this to broadband adoption by zip code, it would be the same map. Yes. The lowest adoption would be dark blue. Yep. Um, we can correlate, as we know, every single thing we work on together, we map it, it looks like this. Mm -hmm. And what really got our elected official attention were those X's. Because once you look at the X's, and imagine those it's like a red flag warning system, right? That these are the zip codes that could next become the lowest life expectancy zip codes. Suddenly, the geographic spread of the problem went in everybody's distress. And now all of a sudden, okay, we're looking at north of the river, we've got zip codes that are decreasing in life expectancy. And you'll see it changes over time depending on the year, right? So this is 2015 data. We saw that 64109 was still one of the lowest life expectancy zip codes, and then it flipped over there with just one additional year of data. This is going to be your highest and lowest gainers in life expectancy. And there's 64, uh, 106 is here. But right now, this is where we're looking for the uh, zip code in the entire city that gained the most life years. I'm going to skip forward. OK, I'm going to get here. So what do we do about it? So that's where we're at. What we do about it is we take our five really heavy issues, break them down into manageable determinants, and just start attacking each one of those determinants with as many brains as possible. And in just a couple years of this being our plan, we have done at least one amazing project as a city in each one of these issue areas that you're going to see. So we should all be very, very proud of ourselves if we don't get lazy. And we keep working, right? And so you're going to see four of these five issue areas have nothing to do with clinical care. Clinical care only predicts about 10% of your health outcomes. 10%. And yet, almost 100% of our national conversation on health is about health insurance. When I tell people that I'm trained in economics and I do health work, their first question is about what insurance plan they should pick. <laughs> and I'm like, it doesn't matter. But I do have very strong opinions about insurance plans. I have very strong opinions on lots of things. Insurance plans is one of them. So you're welcome to reach out for any consultation on that. Hi, Joe. Go ahead. Okay. So this is our. Oh, okay. That's a little. That's a little ugly. I feel like my communications people might be watching and <laughs> really mad about this. Wait, something happened with the font. So um, this is our second major guiding principle that I want everybody in this room to buy into before I go through these issue areas real fast. Um, we like to focus on preventable disease and say that all disease is preventable. Right now, it, nothing is a given. Uh, genetics definitely, definitely can predispose you to certain things. But by saying something preventable, it means that we are tasking ourselves with the responsibility to do something about it. We're not throwing up our hands. We believe that disease is a function of the choices that you make. This is where traditional public health really loves to stop. Like, I almost didn't get a public health degree 
because I hated public health. Like I hated the feel of public health. I hated what I thought about it, right? When I thought about public health, I thought about people like coming into a room like this and saying, like, here's all the things you should not do. Stop doing all those other things. It's gross, right? And then leaving. Public health is so much more than that. Every day I'm working on policies that don't even mention the word health in them. But we know that like, they're critical to health. So we believe that the choices you make are shaped by the chances that you have. And everyone in this room is responsible for shaping chances. That's a really powerful statement, I think. Absolutely. Yes. The school district, PCPS school district, one of 14 school districts in this very room, um, was a huge supporter of our work here. And I'm going to talk about preventable access. This is where you see, oh, here we go. You're like, oh, that's that one per second. That's not, that's not it, right? This is how we measure success for part of it. But you know, we won't be able to do these other things. We won't be able to do those other things without this thing. Digital inclusion came up in every single community session we did. And we did nearly 30 community listening sessions. I hate that phrase. It's the only one I have right now. Engagement sessions where we truly listened. This came up in every one of them. It was the only thing to come up consistently in every group we talked to. We believe that every child needs access to early childhood education. We believe that we should keep them in school. This is where I really want to point out some stuff that KCPS is doing around preventable absences due to school discipline. That's a major uh, passion project for me, and I know for our mayor, and he put a lot of staff time on this. But right in this room, we had a summit where we brought together school leaders from all 14 school districts in the city of Kansas City. 13, 14, I never remember. It's a lot, right? And for every school that attended, we show them, here are your school discipline inequities. Here is the difference between black boys and white boys likely to have been suspended for greater than 10 days in your school, pre-K to third grade. Pre-K, I'm going to say that again. Preschool suspensions. So think about how digital inclusion plays a part in keeping kids on grade level. If they aren't at school in the classroom, they can't learn to read. But if they're home or their parents are home watching them, because little ones, you can't just like leave them alone in the house, what do they have at home to give them resources to keep learning even when they're not in the classroom? Because many schools do not have the infrastructure to do in-school suspension. KCPS is a leader in that, but a lot of our charters or smaller districts or our suburban districts don't have an in-school suspension option. School needs to extend to the home. And I know that's something this group totally gets. Issue number two. This is violence, violence prevention. We're really, really interested in technological innovations around measuring community exposure to violence. So we've gone beyond the health department trying to change the language away from crime prevention to violence prevention, all forms of violence, including violence that happens virtually, right? But what I'm really, really passionate about, Bob walked out, but this is a, a real like puzzle for me is how can we leverage technology to say this community has been exposed to something? And how do we measure it? So you can think of things like shot spotter, right? Like gunshot detection. That can be a measurement of a community exposure to violence because it's like silent victims, right? These are people who uh, hear gunshots. And just that stress, I don't know, a lot of people don't know that like chronic stress, and I don't just mean like, Oh, I'm so stressed today. I have so many meetings. I mean, a, a life lived, repressed, right? A life lived exposed to violence and trauma and adverse things that happened to you as a kid, like that affects your actual physical health outcomes. There are biological mechanisms through which the outside world gets into your body. 
That's usually the missing link for people. They don't understand like how these things that we see in our drawer actually manifest in, in numerous senses. We are um, currently undergoing a rebranding of this issue area because somewhere else in the business plan, so the chip is part of your business plan, your city council adopted business plan, includes an objective on life expectancy, an objective on implementing this, and also an objective on creating paths to economic mobility. This is another area that you will clearly see connections between the work we do and what we're looking for. When we did the shift, we were really focused on these two issue areas. Access to fair credit, to build capital, to invest in homes, businesses. We're taking down predatory lending. I'm just going to say, it's, it's full out work. There's only so much we can do in the city of Kansas City because the state has preempted us from a lot of things. And, you know, the internet's a mixed blessing, right? Because even if I shut down every payday lending establishment in the city of Kansas City, there's still the internet. There's a way to get money right now within five minutes at a 1,000% APR. The average interest rate for a predatory loan in the state of Missouri is 1,100%. And we are not allowed to cap that, but we're looking at creative ways to reduce the burden of predatory lending. We're looking at access to living wage jobs. I know that there was this uh, conference that you were at about from distance jobs, which I think is fascinating. I recently, um, last year, my uh, amazing assistant came to me um, having done distance jobs for Apple. So she was a high-level support person. And uh, it was really amazing to get an assistant who can like help you with your iPhone or your Beats headphones. I just highly recommend it. Like only recruit from an Apple at home specialist. Um, but the economic mobility plan, which I won't have time to get into today, but there are slides here from the last Casey Stacks presentation that we did on economic mobility. Um, there is a citywide work group, which right now is internal mainly, but I know that as we start listening, we're like, exploring some design thinking approaches, like, this is going to be amazing. We are not just writing another plan. We are defining economic mobility as wealth generation and wealth transfer from one generation to another. That is how people get ahead. They get ahead because they inherit it. We know that even at the highest income levels, I'm talking people in Kansas City who make over a quarter million dollars, Black families only have seven cents of wealth for every one dollar that a white family has, even though they're making a lot of money. In our communities of color, most wealth is tied up in home ownership. And you know when a housing crisis hits, those communities are going to be the first to feel it. And there goes all of your wealth. And then don't get me started on student loans, literally, because they call, they're calling. They're like, we gave you enough time. I don't know how this is worth a student loss. So um, we do care about clinical care, and telemedicine is a huge part of that. Cultural relevancy was the number one thing we heard about clinical care. We didn't hear, I don't have a doctor. People have health care. Kansas City, as a city, publicly funds uninsured health care to the tune of $40 million. You can get care for free. People are saying, I don't want to. My doctor doesn't get it. And especially when it comes to behavioral health, mental health, in our lowest life expectancy, folks, they're like, I'm scared to go to a doctor because I'm, I'm like ashamed. Prenatal care. Our prenatal care rates are abysmal for black mothers. Even black mothers have means with insurance. Or like my doctor makes me feel like a criminal or like I don't know what I'm doing, right? All that explicit and implicit bias that happens in a physician's office affects someone's ability to get care. So what if we could just like teleport an awesome doctor that like looks like you, right? Who gets you, who understands you? What if we can have a therapist on demand for our uninsured patients? Right? I have insurance that I means I can open an app on my phone and talk to a therapist at any time. 
But we don't have that same stuff going on in the city for behavioral health. We're looking at it, and thanks to the city council, we have this awesome little reserve fund of the health levy that we're challenging our safety net providers to look at the ship and say, what are you going to do about it other than just provide clinical care? And if they come up with some awesome ideas and partner with community groups like yours, we can give them a little bit of money to try it out. So that's exciting. And I will make a plug that the Health Commission has a committee for almost every one of these projects. And if any of these things is really getting you fired up, uh, we would love to have you apply to be a part of those committees. You can talk to Bill. I think Bill, Bill is on like four committees or something. Bill is a constant presence. So if you have any questions about health commission committees, you can ask them. Um, lastly, the built environment. We like to crosswalk like our goals with goals of other departments and other programs. That way we're not being redundant. And we have, of course, light reduction, food systems, so free housing. But I'm also thinking about like, how your house can fill you. Right? So um, do you does anyone know the number one reason uh, that your house can kill you? What's like the biggest hazard? So if you're lead paint and your mold, those are number two and three. Falling. We had we had one book for falling in the back. I'll just point out this. So trips and falls are the number number one reason people get hurt in their houses, right? So the advent of smart houses so that people can age in place, floors that understand whether your gait has changed that you might be at risk for sure. Like there is so much power in this technology to be harnessed, but it's about making sure it gets to the people who need it the most. And that's probably the biggest takeaway that I know that you believe and we believe as a city, and we're trying to convince policymakers to believe that sometimes it's not going to be everybody gets the same thing. Everybody gets the same access. It's going to be, I'm going to give more to the people who need more. And that might mean that the politically and economically powerful segment of the city might get left out. But they've been getting a lot for a long time. So, right? I'm seeing some like enthusiastic nodding, which is not captured on the Facebook, but I understand. Say that. <laughs> there is like, like people raising hands and stuff like that. Um, so I am making sure that you have all these slides, right? So these slides will the economic mobility stuff. Um, I'm going to get to the most important slide, which is the end, uh, which is my contact info. So uh, I have to head out to another meeting right after this when I wrap up. Um, I'll take a couple questions, but uh, you are free to contact me at any time. It's I'm Googleable. Um, I'm on Twitter as at Sarah Casey Mo. I just hit 500 followers in three minutes. <laughs> um, so I love to like continue the conversation there. Um, there's like this Sunday morning group of tweeters from the city who like read the New York Times and talk about economic mobility on Twitter on Sunday mornings. It's like a strange group of people. Um, so we would love to have you part of that conversation. And thank you for allowing me to have this time with you. I really appreciate it. Questions for sure. Yes. So, would you read up the price conversation yesterday about the, um, um, the non physical violence people from the drive by shootings? And, and in fact, we have this challenge of getting mm -hmm. this particular group. Uh, uh, yeah, so we have um, the CPS grant from the federal government around um, survivors of violence. And, and before we kind of defined that as like someone got shot right next to you, or you know, and, and it was really hard for us to find those folks. But um, recently we have data from the ACP uh, through Council and Kennedy that shows that there were many, many assaults with a firearm. A small proportion of them included people who've been injured. And that's a large group of people who were either there or close or witnesses who disappeared. Right? So I'm really heartened with KCPDs and social workers. But what I'm also heartened about is that the city is investing in a database that will be able to link across social workers, 
across the courts, the health department, the emergency department, that will be able to find people who may have been exposed to trauma and follow them across different providers and see if something bad happens to them, where did we drop the ball? And we can go back and track that. So that's called my resource connection. Um, if your organization is a service providing organization, especially to folks who might get caught up in these cycles of violence or illness um, episodes with police or with courts or with the emergency department, uh, please reach out because we're implementing that this summer. And we need to get service providers to be users of this so that when the courts say, oh, we have someone who has had 10 mentors and has had 20 ambulance rides, where can I connect with the services? The system needs to be fully integrated with what you're doing. So please reach out about that. And anyone from, uh, so I know maybe, yes, why not? Uh, so it's a regional, it could be a regional approach. So this is great. So providers can talk to each other across state lines and across county lines. Thank you to Johnson County for, for that. I can take one more. Yes. What do you do with Vincent Jones? Does uh, say you have adults that can't live at home and need a place to live? So, um, one of the projects that I uh, really hope that we're able to put some city funds to at some point is going to be a uh, true minutes game into the landlord game, basically. So, we have um, a project coming out of true and we're really trying to push that we evaluate it really effectively using some of our resources in the health department. Um, that says that uh, individuals who we like to call it high utilizers of public services, right? So, um, we have people who have a, a lot of mental health burdens who take ambulance rides because they are lonely, right? So that is like the most expensive form of transport is an ambulance. Or where they just walk in the emergency department, they know everybody, they say they have something wrong with them, and they just like sit there for a while. How do we get those folks into supportive housing with wraparound services? We've done an amazing job of that in the city with our persons living with HIV. How do we take the same model for jobs and mental health, substance use disorder treatment, and put that in this group who uh, face extreme mental health challenges. So that will also be connected to that system that I just discussed, and I'm really excited to see where that goes. Oh, and there's a report. Yes, so I'm going to make sure we get that to you. Bill, Bill keeps his reports, like every report he's ever taken from any always up on hand. So um, we have this awesome report which we will make sure we get to you, which is an overview of our health levy indigent care program, where the, where your money goes, uh, what kind of programs it funds, and how many people we're seeing uninsured in Kansas City. So if that's something you're interested in, I'll make sure that you get a copy of that. So with that being said, I am done. I know you guys have like network. So I will pass it back to you and thanks again. Okay. Uh, there's, a, there's a big topic trending right now. If you, if you subscribe to the Google News feed for digital inclusion, there's a topic, and I was even on the panel on uh, this one in New Orleans, one thing called Humanizing Digital Inclusion. I think what Sarah just talked about about really hit that on the head. Second thing is the national spotlight. Have you ever done a TED talk? You want to put Kansas City in the national spotlight? I don't know how many of you will agree. It's, I've been coming to these meetings now for two and a half years. That was the most impactful, clear, lucid, amazing talk I've ever seen. And you need to be in the national spotlight. <laughs> Anybody has connections to the National TED Conference, we're going to get Sarah on there. Well, we, to we, we, we got Mike Lundgren, yes, so Mike. you're in. And this year's all about women in TEDx. So there you go. <laughs> okay, uh, listen, no further ado, let's use the rest of this time. Uh, the network, uh, anyone that you've seen or heard from, uh, take advantage of the time to get to know them better. And don't forget our next meeting. Ooh, when is that going to be out here? June 1st. Uh, yes, first Friday. Uh, of the month is Friday, June 1st. And I think I've got it. It's right. Uh, so much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
There we go. Thanks, everyone.